Sometimes people have what it takes, but they haven't recognized it yet. Just go forward. So what do you need to do? How do you stand out? So what you need to do is be that person. Welcome everybody and hello. And it's this bigger than you think. Rise program. from the ashes and fly like Monday through Friday noon Eastern floor. time. The high performance calls. I appreciate everybody being on. It's good to see all your smiling faces. Everybody's so full of excitement and energy. This is amazing. Um, so consistently, guys, we have these challenges. Just a reminder, this month, it's all about meditation and creativity. And as we look at expanding our creativity, I think being able to be creative in some of these situations, when we talk about business, when it comes to relationships, when it comes to adding value to relationships, when it comes to content, all of these things, if you can increase your level of creativity in that manner, then really you start to remove the limitations of what is possible from some of these relationships. So um, today, that's what I wanted to talk about. Now, we had, Ryan, are you there audio-wise? Ryan uh, did a, a training with us about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, talking about the value of the people in your circle. I don't know if he's there or not. Yes, no, no, yes. Okay, so I want to talk to you guys today a little bit about joint ventures and power teams. Now, these sorry terms, about that. All good. So, I um in a minute I'm just kind of calling you out. I'm going to ask for a quick review of why relationships, why you think relationships are so important, like what you've seen okay. positive and negatively, um, in in how people you know in business go about relationships. Okay. Yeah. So I want to talk today about joint ventures and, um, and power teams. Now, those terms I took from, I borrowed from a group called BNI, Business Network um, International, I believe is what it's called. Some of you guys, how many of you guys have heard of BNI? Some of you business owners, salespeople, some others, so a handful of you. Okay. So BNI is started by uh, Dr. Ivan Meisner here in the United States. Um, it is a industry-specific and exclusive group, meaning you have a group that's begun, and inside of that group, you have 15, 20, 30, 50 different members, and each member is a representative of a different industry. So if I have someone that is a property and casualty insurance agent, then you can't have a second property and casualty insurance agent. You can only have one realtor in the group. You can only have one mortgage broker. I joined when I was doing cleaning and restoration. And so it was just the cleaning. And then over time, they went, nope, you need to decide on either cleaning or restoration. And so we ended up with a carpet cleaner in the group and I was doing the restoration, the water damage and mold remediation and things. And we also had a general contractor in the group and we had, right? So that's kind of how these are formed. Does that make sense? So you meet once a week, you come in, um, everybody. Uh, yeah, so it works through referrals. It is, you know, passing referrals one to another. Um, and you try and meet during the week as well with different members, get an idea about them and their business and what their perfect referral is. And Everybody each week has an opportunity to stand up and give uh, their sales manager minute is what it used to be called. I don't know if it's still called that, but you would get up, you get 60 seconds to say, hi, my name's Andrew David. I'm with, um, you know, Recro Max Restoration. And, you know, this is what we do this week. This is the type of referral that I'm looking for. And so in doing that, I, I love it depending on the type of business you have. So some of you guys that are business owners, I think it can be incredibly helpful. Um, but it, it started taking up a lot of time, right? Yeah, just, just talking about it. attendance is mandatory. So meaning you pay to join, you show up every week at a certain time, you have to be there. If you're going to miss it, you need a substitute. So someone else has to take your place. And if you miss too many times, they can kick you out, right? And you don't get a refund. Like they, you know, it's about taking this seriously and you have to not just show up and get referrals, you have to give referrals. So one of the big things that they talk about is givers gain, meaning the more referrals that you give and the more that you um, help the group benefit, the better off that um, you'll end up being as well. You'll, you'll get kind of this law of reciprocity. You'll get referrals back. Now, one, there's a number of things that I learned during this time. So this is where, so for a lot of you guys, like occasionally I get asked, well, you know, how do you, you know, I talk with all of you guys about 
here's somebody that you should connect with and here's how I would market this and here's how I would approach it. And a lot of that, honestly, for me started with BNI because every week I would meet with two or three or four different businesses in different categories. And I would ask them what their best customer was, what kind of customer they were looking for, you know, what kind of business was a good referral source for them, things like that. And I started doing a lot of that. And then I became a, um, a, a local chapter director. And so I was in charge of two or three other chapters and I would go once a month and I would go train them on how to get more referrals and how to increase their referral business and how to you know, be better in this whole thing. You come to learn though, that not every customer is the same. Not every referral is the same. Some people understand how to give a quality referral and some don't, right? For all of you business owners, just think about it. how many times have you had somebody referred to you, you're like, this is a horrible client. I don't want to work with them, right? This isn't, you know, it, it was just like, uh, someone says, oh, I need, you know, oh, I'm thinking of selling my home. And immediately it's, you need to talk with so-and-so and or that person runs over and gives the name to the realtor and the realtor calls and they go, well, I mean, I, I thought about it, but I'm not like, I'm not selling right now. And really, I'd kind of like to do it myself because I don't want to pay someone. And like, there, so again, level quality of, of referrals. Now we have you guys, right? And we have this opportunity. We have us and we're sitting here. Yeah, tire kickers. We're sitting here and, and we're building our business and we're doing it through organic content. And we're looking and we go, well, how do we create referral relationships um, in a different way, right? You have to look at it too from the point of the perspective of your the businesses that you're working with. A lot of them would go to groups like BNI, Chamber of Commerce, and other referral groups, and they can't do that as frequently as they did. And so now they're trying to figure out how to use social media, and that's where you step in. So it's this weird idea of like, well, how do I in this virtual world, in the social media world, how do I build relationships? How do I identify someone that can? Um, how can I be a benefit to someone? How can someone be a benefit to me? What can I do that's going to increase my reach while adding you know, value to somebody else? How do I go from just liking and commenting and posting on someone else's page or them posting on mine into a conversation, into a relationship? And so those are some of the things that I want to talk to you guys about. Um, and if you have questions along those lines, let me know. Um, you know now's the time to start to bring them up. But first... You, how many of you guys, you've heard that saying that like you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with, right? Okay. Does anybody know where that came from originally? Bruce? Of T. T. Harv Eker? Uh, Jim Rohn. Jim Rohn. Yeah. Before T. Harv. And then a lot of people start to say it. Like it, it is what it is. It's just like one of my favorite quotes from Tony Robbins where he says, you know, people, one reason they don't succeed is because they overemphasize you know, um, the beginning, right? They, they overestimate the beginning and then they grossly underestimate the long term. That's, that wasn't him. That was a guy named Peter Drucker, who was an executive and business management coach and everything, you know, that was famous before Tony was around, right? Um, but yeah, Jim Rohn said that. So Ryan, real quick, um, Ryan had years and years and years in HR dealing with people and, and training businesses about the quality of their human resources, right? And employees and employee relationships and everything else. So Ryan, um, what did you see as far as the, the quality of, like what happened when people had relationships with the right people at work versus when they didn't, when we look at that? Yeah, so what I experienced is that there, you know, there's people that have growth mindsets and people that have fixed mindsets. And and we that's a whole different topic. But if you think about that, if you know what that means is that there are people that, are hanging around people that are they're motivated that they are ambitious and they help each other you know they create synergism you know synergism in a positive way and then you've got a small minority of people which is usually 15 percent or 20 15 percent something like that that have a tendency to just get a hang around people that are complainers right and so they are the ones that are you know, helping, <laughs> help, helping uh, management uh, create systems in place to uh, help increase morale and team, team building because they're the ones that are dragging everybody else down. 
And so when you look at that number though, 15, 20%, guys, you got to think about it. That means out of every five people that you're hanging out with, there's a chance that one of them is one of those complainers and they don't just affect themselves. It creates issues for everybody, right? When you really break down how important relationships are and they talk about, you know, you're the average of these five people, it, it plays into wealth creation, money, right? Think about the five people you spend the most time with. They're, think about how much money they make. Odds are you're somewhere in the middle, right? Maybe you're on the high end, but odds are those five people, like income wise, it's real similar. When you look at health, right? If the people that you spend time with, if you have friends that are obese, then you're a certain, you're as much as like 40% more likely to become obese yourself. You know, they're friends of their friends, friends of friends of friends. It goes all the way out, smoking, drinking, drugs, you know, being healthy, finances, all of this plays into who you spend time with. When it comes to business success, ladies and gentlemen, the same thing applies. If all that you do is look at, um, yeah, you are with whom you associate. It, it's, you need to pay attention to, you know, the overall picture. So what I want to do is look at joint ventures, ideal partnerships, and then building those up. So um, how do you guys build a joint venture? Okay. Um, and then, well, let's look at power teams first. I want to, let's jump over to power teams. Power teams is something that BNI talks about. Some of you guys that have been in BNI before, you've heard the team term power team. What is that? What's that mean? Does any, anybody remember what a power team is? And it doesn't have to be an exact definition, but what would a power team in business be? Anybody? There were a handful of you that raised your hand with BNI. Nobody remember that, that okay. So a power team or is the, here, let's kind of jump in here. A mastermind, it's, it's close to it, right? So a power team down here is, a power team is a group of businesses that's going to work with the same ideal client, your same target audience, your same customer avatar, all mean the same thing, right? So talent, collaboration, contact spheres, similar business line, support group, more business, sharing your market knowledge, marketing together. All of these things are why a power team can be helpful. Okay, so a power team is a list of professionals who you have a relationship with, Um or and that you are in a referral relationship with them, but they work with the same type of clientele. Okay, so let's give some examples. Do we have anybody that's working with um, with real estate as a niche? Real estate's one of the easiest ones to kind of break down. Anybody working with real estate? No. Okay. Give me a niche, guys. Give me some whatever niche you're in right now, the niche that you're in with the partner program. Somebody give me a niche. Sarah and Craig first. Go ahead. Entrepreneurs we're working with. Entrepreneurs? Yeah. Okay. What type of entrepreneur? Let's break that down a little bit more. Because an entrepreneur is simply uh, it's they're a disruptor, they're someone that solves problems, they're someone that is has or is starting a business. That's kind of everybody. So what kind of entrepreneur? Well, since, since we can't bin the boss anymore when we're firing the boss, uh, we're looking for people that are looking for, um, they've probably come through Rich Dad, Poor Dad. They're probably in the E or the S quadrant, and they may be looking to get start their own business or start their own side hustle, that type of thing. So we're not being necessarily specific on what they're working in currently, but they have a desire and a dream to get out of doing that and be their own boss. Okay. So we've got brand new people that are looking to become brand new entrepreneurs that are, have typically been in business for a certain amount of time, right? They've been in whatever their career is for a decade or more. Um, and, and they've been in that industry and now they're trying to make a transition to begin a business for themselves. Is that fair? Okay. So everybody, I mean, most of the people on this call would fall into that category. So if I'm looking for power team opportunities. That means I want to work with other businesses that work with that same individual. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what other types of businesses are going to, are, are going to be going after that same target audience and what types of businesses is that individual going to be looking at, right? 
So this goes to understanding your target audience really well. Marketers, accountants. Yeah, so if I've got someone that starts a brand new business, they're going to need an accountant, right? And there's a very good chance that they do that. So they look for CPAs. Now, occasionally I'll get people to go, well, I'm going to, you know, a lot of them will do the accounting themselves. Yes, they will. Fine. Great. Go look for obstacles if you want to go look for obstacles. I'm looking for businesses that want to, that are going to work with them. Um, connected investors. Okay, so, but what are they investing in? So in, in the particular explanation that Craig's talking about here, it wouldn't necessarily be, we're looking for people that may not be looking for big in investment funding, you know, fundraiser type scenarios. They're trying to start their own thing. Um, so a lot of these people are operation managers in their own right. Okay, so there's different ways that we can look at this. There's businesses that they're going to be going after. So um, some of them may be starting like an online business, I think is what a lot of you're talking about. So they're, um, maybe people that run virtual assistant programs, right? We're going to look at CPAs. Um, we're going to look at, um, let's see, graphic designers. Yeah. Right. Like if you could hook up with a graphic designer that specializes with somebody, I don't know. And, you know, maybe you could search it out on Fiverr. You find someone that specializes in a certain category and we find them and they do a ton of graphic works for, um, for new entrepreneurs. Then you say, Hey, I know you're going to be doing graphics for a lot of these guys. It seems like you've got a lot of gigs for brand new, you know, that you've completed for brand new entrepreneurs. You know, I've got this that can help them with their marketing if you refer them over, then I can give you a small percentage, right? Or I can refer people back to you. So we start to look at different businesses. So we have, if, you know, if we go to real estate, then people that would fit into that power team would be mortgage. It would be um, CPAs. It would be title. It would be home inspectors. It would be contractors. It can be attorneys, all of those things, right? That's your power team. So it could be like with, Sarah and Craig, um, personal development coaches. And then we also have elements that we could look at that would be influential in that niche too. So you mentioned this, the idea of power teams, is this making sense with anybody? Am I creating more confusion or, or do we have, is this making sense? So if you can find some people, so if you're going after accountants, then I'm going to look for attorneys and I'm going to look for other people that the accountants might go after would be, or that would go after accounts would be real estate and mortgage, et cetera. Right. If, if the niche that you're working in is um, personal trainers, or maybe you're going after chiropractors. So then I'm going to, I'm going to connect with attorneys and I'm going to connect with personal trainers and nutritionists and massage therapists and others that may also be working with chiropractors. Right. Do we see how that kind of flows? Right. So think about where you're at. So if we have, you know, if, if you're going after insurance agents, then I'm going to look at you know, if I've got the property casualty or I've got life and health, right? Because two totally different things. Now, obviously, some agents sell both, but who's going to refer may be a little bit different, right? So what I'm trying to identify, you guys think about the niche that you're going after, right? Dave, you're there. Come off. Of, what niche are you in? Either type Dave Latham, either type in there or, or tell me what niche that you're in. Um, I'm going after martial arts instructors. Martial arts instructors. Okay, great. So to you, for you to create a power team, and then I'm going to talk, uh, Chantel posted there and, and Chantel, that's perfect, right? So if you're, if you're a coach, then Physio, Cairo, health, like all of those people can refer to you. You can also refer to them. If I'm going after martial arts instructors, then what I'm going to look at is, is, you know, who else would the martial arts instructors work with and who else wants to work with martial arts instructors? So it could be um, like, I don't know, the people that sell equipment the right kind of yeah, equipment. Um, the there's going to be different associations around the world that, that they're going to be a part of. There's going to be a number of those um, regular gyms that don't necessarily offer that because there's always cross synergy there. Uh, I'm going to look at parent associations. You know, if I can get connected with a parent association, that's, you know, sending all of their kids to karate. Right. So, I mean, there's all sorts of different things. So you kind of put it together like that. When you look at, at that power team, I'm looking for people that are going after the same target audience that I am. 
one key element to building a good power team is finding a way to add value to them without just saying, hey, I work with the same client that you do. You should refer me. Right? Like I mentioned the graphic designer earlier. Like if I found someone that was a graphic designer on Fiverr, the first thing I said to them wouldn't be, I've got something cool that that uh, you could refer and make money. I wouldn't say that. First thing I would do is say, how busy are you? Well, I, I, I wish I could be busier. Or I'm too busy. Okay, are you looking to like grow, like work with someone else so you can handle more clients or, the, or what's going on? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I get enough gigs that I could probably hire somebody to work together with me. Great. Well, I work with entrepreneurs as well. And so, we, you know, a lot of them ask me for graphic designers. So I end up connected to a few. So if I look, if I find someone that's interested in, in doing more work, would you like me to connect them with you? Yes, absolutely. Well, and, and since I work with so many brand new entrepreneurs and they need this extra service, is that something I can refer directly to you? Or would you prefer, you know, that I look for someone else? Do you have, and if they go, well, I don't know, you, here's a great thing to say to someone that you're trying to get referrals from, or you're trying to refer to, and Craig may know exactly what I'm about to say. He's kind of smiling here. So if someone goes, well, I'm, I'm not sure, but you go, great. Do you have a competitor? Like, do you have someone else that does what you do that like when you can't handle the work that I can send it to instead, I want to make sure that, I mean, I want to take care of my clients. Who can, who can I help? Um, and a lot of times I go, no, no, I mean, I can take it, right? Like I've got so much that I can give you. I don't think you can handle it anyway. So I'm going to find somebody else, right? It's a great way to start a relationship. Not really, because if they can't handle it, then I'm absolutely going to find somebody else. And if they're going to push back too much, then honestly, I'm not going to want the relationship anyway. So I'm being as straight up, I'm saying it works, Right. So that you just got to look at it how it is. Like Chantel, you're you're a coach, right? So you're doing transformational coaching. If I come to you and I say, look, I work with a lot of people that um that need coaching, right? Like let's say I'm I'm I do some coaching, but I don't do much one-on-one -on -one anymore, right? So you know, how many people are you looking for more clients? And you'd say yes, and you go, Great. How many can you handle? Well, I can handle up to this. Okay, good. Um, so that's great. We work something out. I've got someone I think I can refer to you. We'll talk, right? Can you give me a little bit more of what you do, your pricing, blah, blah, blah. I'll get some people to you. If you told me, you know what, I'm, I'm kind of busy, but man, I, I get that. It's, that's a great problem to have. Do you have someone else that you work with either a competitor or a friend or someone else that you can refer to when you get busy? So there's different ways of saying that. If you don't want to go too hard and say, do you have a competitor that's you know, that I can give to instead. You can say, do you have someone else that you refer to when you get too busy? And then they're either going to say, yeah, here's somebody else I can work with or you can work with, or they're going to say, no, 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 I can handle it. Now, if they go, here's someone else you can work with, what did I just get? I just got another possible referral source, not just a one-off referral. I got a whole nother referral source. You could ask, do you have a couple of other people that you refer to when you're too busy? Well, yeah, here's two or three. That when I'm too busy, I refer my clients over there. Well, now I got two or three other referral sources that can send me work, that can send clients to me because I'm trying to be the end all be all for um, cleaners and restorers or for this or for that, right? And I'm connecting with a power team. Do you guys understand where I'm going with this and how it's, right? So Richard, sometimes can be a genuine concern as existing clients may represent a conflict of interest versus new ones. What do you mean, Richard? Can you come off of uh, mute and explain your what you mean? Yeah, yeah. In, in my world, you're breaking up product products. Oh, sorry, let me headphones. Can you go again? Are you there? Uh, yeah, just change my headphones. Is that better? Okay. Yeah, much better. Is it new new. Um... Ear, earbuds don't seem to work too well <laughs> um yeah in my world I, I work with brands and i'm i'm in my other business and i'm um basically building a business with major retailers so in, in us it'd be walmart target cvs those kind of people i'm taking brands into those retailers mm -hmm. so sometimes i might be talking to a brand of coffee and then another brand of coffee comes along that's a 
conflict of interest. So right. for me, I can't really represent two brands of coffee. Right. So, yeah. So in that, you'd, you'd need someone else that you can refer over to. Exactly. Right? You say, look, I'd, I'd love to be able to help you, but I have to do this. So yeah, obviously, industries, certain industry specifics may may require you to have those other things, right? The best way to build a to figure out who you want to build a power team with is to understand your audience, right? So Blake talks about that. I talk about that. Figuring out who your customer avatar is, what do they like? What do they buy, right? So when I was doing cleaning and restoration, one of the best, um. A handful of the best referral sources to me because when I was doing cleaning, I was charging more and I was doing like, uh, you know, higher end carpet cleaning. I was doing high end rugs like wool rugs and specialty rugs and I was doing marble polishing. So one of my best referral sources were Lexus, Mercedes and BMW dealers. Right? Someone saying something? I don't know. I heard something. Sorry. But does that, can you guys see why that would work? If I got someone that's spending $10,000 on an area rug, well, odds are they're not going to buy, you know, a used jalopy. They're going to buy a luxury vehicle, right? Their mindset is they want something nice, right? And and it, it becomes, you know, a, a Mercedes client. So what other things are they doing? What other things are they, um, are they buying, right? Who else are they working with? Estate attorneys, other people like that, right? So you got to understand who your audience is. And then in understanding who your audience is, you want to connect with um, who they're doing business with and who wants to do business with them. So if I approach someone and I say, look, I'm working with, like say your niche is, um, I'm trying to see who's on here, personal trainers. Right. Well, then I'm going to look for everybody that may work. You know, I'm going to look at gyms and I'm going to look at um, MMA gyms. I'm going to look at dietitians. I'm going to look at personal development coaches. I'm going to look at, um, you know, maybe smaller, you know, now they have personal shoppers. I mean, there's all sorts of different things. Like I'm going to look for people that are, you know, doing hormone replacement therapy because a lot of times, you know, companies that are selling hormone replacement therapy aren't also doing the personal training. So I'm going to connect them there. Right. So understanding that, because here's here's why this is important, guys. You know, when you're trying to figure out how you can find businesses, again, understanding your audience is going to be the key way, because all things being equal, people want to do business with their friends. So if you're referred by a friend, you're much more likely to get that that referral opportunity. All things not being equal, people still want to do business with their friends. So even if what you have costs more, people are going to want to do business with a friend or a referral before anything else. You want to make sure that you are friendly. You got the ability to engage, a willingness to give value first. Um, and then this is where kind of understanding how can I make a difference when I'm so small? Finding ways to add value to their business, right? The things that you're learning, yes, it works for whatever niche that you're in. But if you can give some ideas to someone else that could possibly refer to you, you know, find something on the um, the PLR, the private label rights website, you know, find some white label thing, go, Hey, I found this great article for realtors to be able to use, you know, you might find this useful. I saw this, um, about your industry. So like you're studying out the real estate, if you see something about mortgage and rates and everything else, say, you know, talk with the mortgage lender about that, like build a relationship with them, because if they can constantly give you referrals, there's a lot to do there. So, all right, I'm going to get a little bit more specific on some of these things tomorrow. Keith, go ahead talking about businesses you personally use because you're their client. Yeah, absolutely. Keith? Andrew, I have a question. Um, this is actually a, a real life situation uh, that I've experienced recently. So last year, uh, for 12 months, I prototyped a business, uh, which, which essentially got us about 70% on our returns. And recently we spoke to you know, a couple of investors probably out of 50, maybe two were interested, but one was really interested to kind of take our business and prototype it in his, um, in his province. And, you know, instead of, instead of giving us, you know, the, the, the funds that we required, and I thought it would be a great idea to kind of have him um, 
do that. But what I want to understand from you know this part team's conversation is what what kind of value could I provide him as you know as somebody who could potentially be be a long term re- uh, p- partner to to my business. I'd have to get some more info from you on what the product is, what you would bring to the table, what he's if he's just bringing money to it, or if he's um, going to be running everything. If he's got an existing infrastructure that would allow him to just integrate whatever you have into his business, and then he just pays you out, or if it's a royalty deal. I mean, there's so many different variables there, but that's one of those. But that question that you're asking, I think, is key in all of this. Um, you got to find a way to add value to every relationship that you walk into, right? Everything guys, every relationship you walk into, what can I do to add value to them? Right. Too many times as new marketers, as new business owners, you're approaching it um, in the wrong way. You're approaching it in a way of saying, you know, how soon can I get referrals from them? How do I make money out of this? Right? If you approach it through a slightly different perspective and say, you know, how fast can I help them get some referrals and make money? If I do that with a handful of the right people that I can put into this power team, and then there's different levels to power teams as well, right? You, you know, you have people that are really big that could consistently refer business to you. Um, but if you can figure that out, it takes a little bit longer to do that, right? And you want to continually do your marketing to get the organic reach. But if I can figure out a handful of those referral sources to send me an influx once in a while, because I've added value to them, that's when your business starts to explode in a way, right? And it's a hell of a lot easier to do something like that than go spend $10,000 a month in advertising to reach a certain amount of people, right? So we'll we'll get a little bit more into the power teams, um, yeah, how to give versus receive. Um, and I'll give you some specifics and how to find influential people in your niche on different levels. So we'll, tomorrow I'm going to dive in and, and I'm going to ask for different niches from you guys. And we're going to look up people on Facebook and Google and try and come up with lists of like where you should be and where you should be pulling content from and who you should be engaging with. Okay. So that, cause that'll lead into the content that we do on a consistent basis. Okay. So Hopefully we, I mean, right today, I just want you guys to start thinking about the power of relationships and we'll get more in depth with um, some of the other elements, but uh, let me just hit on a couple of these and then Craig, I'm going to have you come out. Okay. Um, So just saying I sold high end jewelry for fundraising company owned by my friend, mark up the product, tell her it was too high. She said people want to pay more because it makes them feel, yeah, absolutely. still shocking to see increasing the prices would make a piece sell faster. It happens guys. Like, I too often I hear people like we've got the 737-197 masterclass and then you have things like the DFY plus that you can add in all the time. I get people that say like, well, should we, I mean, can I lower the price of the masterclass? You know, the DFY is at 990. Can I sell it for less? Sell it for more, sell it for more, raise the price. And I was giving this example earlier today um, with, <clears throat> and this goes to understanding your audience and who you cater to and how you cater to it. This goes to your branding, your message, how you're putting out the the information. If you're giving value and it's free, then paying a few bucks for something and helping them understand what they could gain as they do it. That's what marketing and sales is, right? The value that I'm giving you is, is worth more than what you're giving me to get it, right? That's what marketing and sales is. You look at it, you go, hey, the value is worth more than what I'm paying, so I'm going to do it. When I started cleaning carpet, um, my... Have you guys ever seen those on bands or the, they call them bandit signs or whatever, where it says, you know, $20 per area or hundred dollars for the whole house or different things like that to do carpet cleaning. So when I started clean carpet, when we did residential, um, my father-in-law business partner would do $20 per area. Okay. Hot water extraction, truck mount, super like, you know, guaranteed to get it clean, all that kind of stuff, but $20 per area. So like this room would be considered one area, 20 bucks. Living room, if the living room was extra big, maybe he considers it two areas, $40, right? So most houses you'd walk into, it'd be somewhere between 100 to, um, you know, $140, $160 for a whole house, right? And he would say he had a minimum of like 40 or $60, like not much at all, right? 
And he would go in and he would do the work. And I was always saying, you know, we need to charge more. Like, it doesn't make sense for me to drive to someone's house, turn on a truck mounted machine, unroll a hose, clean for two hours to walk out of there with, you know, $80, you know, and he wouldn't charge more if it like, even if there were pets or it was extra dirty, like he wouldn't, but because, because in his mind, his, you know, where he was, it was all referral based. And, and he, he said, you know, but that's the value and everyone's so happy. And if I charge more, I'm going to lose clients. And I don't want to lose clients because I'm blah, blah, blah. Right. All of these ideas about money and what people wanted and everything else. And I said, you know, we've got to, we've got to change this up. So what I started to do after a while, I said, well, I started creating, I created three different packages. Instead of charging per room, I charge per square foot. And even at the cheapest package, which was already, I, I increased the level of service. I did more, but even at the cheapest package, it, it cost more than what he was charging overall. So it was like, I want to say like 35 cents a square foot, 54 or 59 cents, and then like 70 something. Now the 70 something cents a square foot included like wiping down baseboards and AC vents and, um, you know, stain protector and a, you know, a free cleaning for three months, if anything got spotted or dirty, like it was, you know, super platinum. 80% of clients chose the middle package. So a room like this, instead of it being $20 was now $60, $59, right? The house that used to cost 140, all of a sudden was, you know, you're making 300, 400, $500. And you lose a couple of clients. But for, you know, I could clean one house and make just as much as three or four before. I could do two houses and make more than I used to make in eight. So it's working a lot less. I could provide a higher quality and people were happy um, because in a sense, some of them, just like what Jess is saying here, some of them would buy that hot, higher dollar package. Some would even buy the highest dollar one simply to say they bought the highest dollar package because that's what they wanted. Now I made sure that we delivered and the value was there, but a lot of times they would do that. But that type of client didn't come from, you know, it came from a different power team, a different circle of influence. I needed to change my perspective on how I was getting clients and I needed to work with people that I, that were working with the client that I wanted. And I remember one time my, my ex and her dad were talking and they went, I would never pay you that much for, um, you know, for that work, I would never pay that much for cleaning. And I remember looking and, and saying, that's great because you're not my ideal client. And sometimes you guys are so worried about the content that you're putting out <clears throat> or how you're going to be perceived that you're stopping yourself from adding value to your existing audience. And then the people that you could partner with, because you're judging based off of your ideas versus what your audience is probably thinking, right? Stop doing that overall with content, like get content out. <clears throat> and every time you do figure out how you can add value to the people that you're trying to work with. Anyway, I just kind of rolled there. Um, what do you call the conglomerate of business people, one per area that form a group? Um, you're talking about BNI that I was talking about that group, the business network international, or are we talking about something else? Um, all right. So can we get power team presentation sent on email? Um, I'm going to dive a little deeper into it tomorrow, Matea, and then I'll give you guys the slides inside the, uh, the Skype group instead of sending out an email. Okay. Anyway, we'll get more into relationships and how to build those up and how to add value and everything um, tomorrow. A great training that I, I did on this or that we had a great call that we had was from a guy named Kevin Thompson. If you scroll all the way, you know, look at, at, um, at my channel and look up Kevin Thompson when you go in there and search and you'll find something about million dollar relationships. Kevin Thompson's an amazing dude, all about building relationships, a lot of great training there. So on that note, appreciate you guys being on. Everybody hang out for a minute. We're going to bring on Craig Robinson, Sal Simpson. Isn't that how you normally do it? Um, <laughs> Sal so, All right. So, um, Craig has a cool story and, and, you know, you, you see him all the time where he's at and occasionally his, uh, lovely bride joins him. Oftentimes he has her doing construction while he sits and hangs out with us. Um, no. so, <laughs> um, but 
I'm going to let him, I'm going to ask a couple of questions, kind of let him tell the story. Cause I just think it's so cool. And, and um, his accent is cooler than mine anyway. And then we'll um, go from there. We'll, we'll roll to, uh, to public speaking and things. So um, great. How did you and Sarah get from, well, where are you from? Where are you now? Let me start that. Okay. Um, regarding the journey of, of yeah, a little, little bit about the journey. So, um, okay, well, you know, Sarah, where are you guys Sarah, from originally? Sure. Sarah, Sarah was from, um, see Ricky. Uh, yeah. That's our, our electricians just left, so there won't be any banging and, and, and stuff in the background. So that's good. Um, well, Sarah's joining me again now. She's finished working with the construction people. So here she is. Um, and just to keep it brief and, and in the same vein, um, Sarah is a chef and um, also a, a lecturer. And the thing that, that most disappointed me about that was the fact that I never got to see her. Uh, she'd leave the house at sort of seven o'clock in the morning and come in at 11 o'clock at night. And for her working in, the, in that industry, um, it was pretty normal, wasn't it? Um, and I was working as a contract project manager, uh, working for building software and redesigning um, sort of you know, databases and software as a service and, and, and building stuff for people like DEFRA, um, your environment agency, I think it's called something like that, but it's, it's our environment agency and things. And I was working with a boss who basically drove me up the freaking wall right. and in, I decided that I'd had enough. Sarah decided that she'd had enough. And I've got an old school. I have a file fax, a leather brain. And in the front page of this leather brain is a picture of a little goal that I had years and years and years and years and years and years and years ago, which, as you can see there, hopefully, is a beautiful old wooden catch. And we now live aboard a slightly bigger than that old wooden catch now we needed to have a job that would give us um, enough income to be able to renovate her because she was built in 1955 and she's a bit like a layer of an onion everybody's added little bits to her right. uh, so we need to pull all that out and put new stuff in and then also we may well be off um, off grid for two or three weeks especially if we take andrew up on his very kind offer of coming and chilling out and playing volleyball on the beach in florida we're currently floating off the south of Spain. So that's going to take us two to three weeks to sail that far. And we needed a, an income that was going to still be running, even if we are completely out of touch with the world as we know it. Right. And some research and found, um, found Blake's program. So that's where we are. And that's how we got here. That's fantastic. So, you know, going from the work, the office, the, the, job that you know the boss that you needed to bin that you weren't super <laughs> happy with um to being able to sit off the coast of spain so um now we wanted to talk a little bit about public speaking how did you get into public speaking like where did you get trained uh, well i didn't get trained i i, I had a, a job I was, I was a student um, and i needed to pay off some um money uh, basically off my loan so I got a job selling um, life insurance in the evenings, and I'd never done it before. I was 19 years old. I had hair on the top and none on the bottom. And um, I was sitting in guys my age, living room, and telling them all about the importance of life insurance. And they turned around to me and they said, I'm not being funny, mate, but you're 19, 20 years old. What do you know about life insurance? And I said, well, true story, I was 13 when my dad, who was an architect and surveying a block of top, a block of flats, fell off the top. And, of course, falling off the top of a block of flats is very bad for your health. If he would not had life insurance, my mum would have been well and truly up the swanny without a paddle. And I don't know what I would have done. You know, we, we would have had to have muddled through somehow. And um, just by simply telling that story, they sort of think, well, actually, do you know what? I've got three kids and, and a dog and a house and a mortgage and a wife. And a, yeah, I probably need to get some life insurance. So I, I went from a new starter to the highest performing salesman in the country um, in about four months, which was crazy, uh, really. And they asked me to speak at a conference. And I'd spoken to my team before, who was like six people. And they said, yeah, OK, so 
go on and, and speak. So I went on expecting to speak to about 10 to a dozen people, and there were nearly 2,000 people there. And it's like, Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I got into speaking. <laughs> so when we look at why is public speaking important for you know everybody, especially, well, just regular people, why would you say public speaking is important? Um, well, Joe has just actually said something there, which is very, very true. And it is the start, the art of storytelling. Um, I, I do, I do tell stories. I've, I've, I've told stories in local schools and um, read poems to people. And, and it, it, it's fantastic. I, and I don't know if anybody remembers this chap, um, but it was a guy called Peter Ustinov that used to go around um, and basically you would have an evening of him telling stories. And if you ever get the chance, I don't know if he's on YouTube, I've not even, up until this point here, I've not actually even thought about it, but he was fascinating. Um, and my dad took me to see him. My dad was a bit of a quirky character. And um, yeah, I just fell in love with storytelling. And consequently, that's, that's, that's what it is, really. Um, does, that answer, does that answer your question? Why is it important? I think it's important if... if it, one of the things that you mentioned earlier was BNI. Interestingly enough, I've got a, a little bit of a slide deck if you want me to go through it, but it's only about four or five slides. Um, I was the regional director for a, um, a company which is a, a competitor of BNI. And um, again, we had one of the fastest growing groups, and it was mainly because everybody that came in got an induction. And the induction was, um, you're terrified of public speaking, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a window cleaner. I'm, a, I'm an accountant. I'm a computer programmer and a graphic designer. I've never been public speaking. Great, okay, so what we'll do is, and I took the, the Toastmasters stuff that I've been through, implemented it in our group, and it grew massively. Um, we, were t we were the top eight. Um, I, had, I had five groups that I managed personally, uh, and my region was, was 28 groups. Um, and the, the 28 groups did more than the rest of the country put together uh, in fact probably about four of them did that and they were the ones that everybody that was new got an induction and um, storytelling no everybody knows what accountants do but nobody knows why they should they should come to you as an accountant rather than somebody else and so a story allows you to to kind of get that message across why working with you would be better so um you know they talk about public speaking is one of the biggest fears on the planet, right? People are more scared. What do they say? People are more scared of public speaking than they are dying. Um, a lot of people. And we have, I can't tell you how many members I work with when I go, how do you want to brand yourself? Well, I don't, I don't want it to be me. I, yeah. I don't want to be the one talking. So what do you tell someone when they say that, you know, Hey, I'm deathly afraid of public speaking. I, I don't want to put myself out there. Sure. Um, is it possible for me to share my screen with you? Because yep. that might not Yeah, be you should be able to. Uh, okay, share screen. You'll have to tell me what you can see because I've got it on. Um, there we go, screen two. So I'll share that one now. So you can all presumably see that. Yep. How to speak conf with confidence and authority. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it says down at the bottom, past president, social master, multi-contest winning public speaker and breakfast networking, networking regional director. Um, that's, that's true. All of that's true. Um, but in answer to your question, um, what do I tell people when they're looking at the, at the next one? Um, just bear with me one second. There we go. As a child, you're born with three fears. Uh, you're born with a fear of falling. If you'll see them on YouTube all the time, and you've got a, a glass. Um, this, the, the, it's like usually a checker, like a check checkerboard, and you go. The child's walking across it, or there's another one where they're on a bridge, or they're on one of these these high buildings, like you get in you know Seattle Tower and stuff. And the child will go to the edge of the of the of the glass and stop. They mm -hmm. born with a fear of falling. They're also born with a fear of loud noises. That comes from our chimpanzee um, stage. And if you look at baby chimps, they'll run to the tree or run to the mother. And we have the same fear. And abandonment. Every, every other fear that you've got, you've learned yourself 
And the only reason you've learned it is to scare yourself. So it's about time that we stop scaring ourselves, um, especially when the fear of public speaking comes first and second. This is a book written by a guy that I've met, Peter Roper, smashing bloke, and um, I got a copy of the book, signed by him, and death came third. This is true. Um, it's on Amazon. I took this screenshot yesterday, so it's, you know, it's a live book. And if you read it, it actually says, the top two responses were walking into a room full of strangers and speaking in public. Now, when you are speaking to somebody on a video, you are effectively speaking to an audience of 8 billion people, possibly. Now, that's terrifying. Unless you get the butterflies that are in everybody's stomach flying in formation. And the way to do that is to take control and not expect too much of yourself. So the reason that, that people are scared of speaking is because they are frightened of being thrown in at the deep end. Well, you're not going to be thrown in at the deep end. For people who are competent speakers, um, we do something called, um, in Toastmastering, we do something called table topic. And you don't know what you're going to be speaking on. You walk to the front of the room, you're given a topic, and you have to speak for three minutes on that topic. And it could be anything from, um, I don't know, Magic Roundabout to um, Pepper the Pig to Wellington Boots. It could be absolutely anything. And you have to make up something on the spot. All the stories have three things, a beginning, a middle, and an end. And as long as your video presentation has a beginning, a middle, and an end, people will follow this, the story. And the story is in your voice, and it's your story. People want to listen to you. And this is the other thing that I get. In, the, in days gone by, before these amazing um, handheld computers that we laughingly call phones were in our pockets, um, I used to do talks on uh, dictaphone. Um, and dictaphone for the younger members of the, of, the, of the group are tape. And they had little tiny microphones that were condensing microphones that picked up absolutely everything and made you sound terrible. And there's a reason why I put skull there. When Andrew or I or Dave or Richard or anybody speaks, your entire skull is resonating very much like a violin or a, or a, a, a guitar or a piano. It, it resonates and it has a, 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 a timbre, which means that it's, it's deeper and it's more resonant and it sounds great. But what comes out of here is very different. But believe it or not, what comes out of here is actually your voice. So get used to it. If you sound tinny, if you sound weak, if you sound flustered or fluffed, pause. If you listen to, um, if you listen to say Russell, we all know Russell Bunsen and we all know Andrew. If you listen to two minutes of Russell and two minutes of Andrew, you will spot there's a very big difference. Andrew uses pauses to make effect, just like I did there. That was a two second pause. And Andrew isn't worried, frightened or scared of using pauses. And he does it to a great, um, great effect. Russell, on the other hand, is trying to talk at magazine, magazine, super fast. And sometimes he talks so fast, so he actually falls over his own feet. And I'm not dissing Russell in any way at all. It is a different presentation. But if you listen to the, if you listen to them side by side, and who could you listen to for an hour? If you listen to Russell for an hour, you would probably fry your head. But Andrew will captivate and keep you with him for hours on end, as he does. That's why we keep coming back here every week, Andrew. So thanks very much for that. The next thing is you'll learn uh, one last thing and that will tell everybody, and Nike, you've got an insight into this, so you've got to keep quiet on this. Everybody try and say with me, Bing. Just say it now, Bing. Bing, bang. Bing. And then, bang, and then bong. Now, to start off with, you need to be standing up when you're doing a presentation, whether it's a video presentation or whatever. 
because your lungs are being squished at the moment and it's not good. So stand up whenever you're doing something. We're sitting down now for convenience sake, but that's all. But Bing, if you're not saying along it, you know you're all on mute, but just say Bing and listen to your voice. Bing, bang, you'll hear that it's gone down a little bit. And then bong, and bong is the O. Oh, it's a deep, low, resonant tone. And that is how you speak with authority. Ladies, especially so, because you naturally have a higher voice and you also tend to get a little bit more flustered and begin to do. And I do this from experience. It's not a sexist thing. It's just it's just the way that ladies tend to be. You tend to start higher and go higher. So in the end, it is only the dog on the screen that can hear you. And fellas, we start high, but fortunately, we have a lower register. So we are still audible, even when we are nearly running out of breath. And that's pretty much it. The secret to public speaking is breathe, enjoy yourself, and push that bong. Awesome. Well done, sir. Everybody, round of applause for Craig. Awesome stuff. Really, really cool. That was awesome. Um, Public speaking, guys, is something that, you know, like Craig was talking about, hey, it could hit 8 billion people on this planet. But the reality is, especially at the very beginning, you know, video, your social media feed is an amazing way to practice speaking because nobody's going to see the damn thing at the beginning anyway. So just put it out there. Right. A big part of this is just getting out of your own head. And and if you're freaking out about it, there's ways to film video without you being the, you know, on camera. Um, and if you absolutely have to, there are, look at that, Craig, we got someone asking for you to just speak with them all day long. Well, he's going to start a podcast soon. Maybe you do, you film the affirmations and, and record that. Um <laughs> But um, here's, would you mind dropping your social media handles? Yeah, drop it into, Craig, you're in the Skype group, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, drop it in there. Um, here's, like, guys, what we're trying to do is help you guys understand how powerful speaking can be. And you have a platform now to do that. And you've probably, um, you're going to have more of an audience that you think over time, if you're patient with it. Um if you're paralyzed by fear, slowly work your way out of it, but don't also don't let that stop you. Right. So look at it from both sides. Like I've got a friend and I've used his example before, but he wasn't the base of his brand for years. Sometimes people have what it takes, but they haven't recognized it yet. Let me just wrap go it up. forward. Appreciate it. What do you awesome. need to do? Love How you do you stand out? What you need to do is be that person that's different and is bigger than you think. Rise from the ashes and fly like the phoenix as they should draw line.